So right now, for example, if you really like this restaurant that you went to, you would fill in this review for Google, but you don't really get anything out of it, right? Like maybe somebody could see that you've reviewed like a bunch of restaurants and that's great, but you don't get compensated with anything. At the same time, we also know that in general, online reviews are losing trust because a lot of companies actually buy fake reviews and, um, you know, you can, I think they're selling them for, people are selling fake reviews for anywhere from like 25 cents to $100. And all of this is, you know, money and in the economy that could actually go towards honest contributors. And I think the blockchain is what gives us that technology that allows us to be able to design what we believe is a trust-based review system. And we're starting off now with NFTs, but we really see there being a potential to be able to grow this from NFTs to other Web3 products like DAOs. But, you know, what about outside of Web3, right? So what if you could get compensated for writing a review for a movie or a restaurant or a travel experience and using those rewards to actually redeem for certain things that, you know, you value. Welcome to another episode of Curated, where we have wandering conversations with thought leaders in the Web3 ecosystem. I'm Sabi and I'm here with Tyler. And on today's show, we had Debbie Soon, co-founder of Hug. Hug is a new inclusive verse but creators and collectors who are building, collaborating, discovering, and embracing Web3. Hug has three different products, Hug Hub, Group Hug, and Hedge Hug. Hug Hub is a community for discovering NFTs through community source reviews. Group Hug is a Web3 accelerator for Postman NFT projects and up-and-coming one-of-one artists. Hedge Hug is a hands-on advisory program for a limited number of early-stage pre-mint projects. The one thing that stood out to us the most is how they are thinking about the discovery process of NFTs as more projects are continuously launched and it's making it easier with research you can trust. It was a very insightful conversation and we hope everyone enjoys the show. So super excited to learn more about Honestly, Hug Hub, that's one of the things that when we were doing our research, I'm super curious about. But I kind of wanted to start with how did Hug come about, basically? Let's start there, and then I want to dig down deeper into Hug Hub mostly. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, I've been uh, in startups now for about four, I guess, full-time, about four years or so. But I founded my first startup actually eight years ago as a side hustle. And uh, I was in the middle of winding down my last startup, and that was when I started getting really interested and excited about Web3, but then realized, look at my resume and realized I had nothing that was Web3 related. Uh, So just started honestly putting feelers out there, started getting on Twitter again, never used Twitter before, I just started writing content. And um, on one of the Discord uh, communities that I was in basically put out this bad signal to say, hey, you know, I'm looking to move into Web3 full time. Like uh, I haven't worked in Web3 before, but, you know, I have all of these entrepreneurial skills, yada, yada, yada. And then um, none other than Randy Zuckerberg basically responds to this message about a week after I had posted it, which, you know, if anybody knows in Discord, time is complete eternity. So genuinely have no idea uh, how she found that message, but somehow she did. She responded to it. Uh, We get on a Zoom call a couple of days later and in two weeks, we were officially working together. And so, um, and from there, Hug was born. Uh, But I guess more specifically about Hug itself, Randy, uh, you know, if you know anything about her, has been a huge proponent of the arts for several years. You know, she's a Tony Award winning Broadway producer. She has acted on Broadway herself. So was really attracted to the whole industry of NFTs really through supporting creators and artists. So through all of that, I think in 2021, she suddenly found herself, uh, you know, advising a number of different NFT projects. And, you know, I think while that was great and she really enjoyed it, she realized that, well, there was a limit to how many more projects that she could personally advise. And so when she, when we connected and she approached me, she really came with the idea of how do we scale, you know, this advisory and mentorship that she was providing to be able to serve a larger group of creators. And like I said, I've been involved in startups for a number of years. So it was something that I was just really excited to do. It was less to me about Web3 per se, but really about how do we share uh, our experience in entrepreneurship and in business to really mentor creators who are discovering their inner um, business person. Uh, And then from there, you know, we opened up applications for our accelerator cohort. So we started taking in um, a lot of projects and creators, uh, mostly focused on diverse creators because a large part of our mission is to really level the playing field for anyone to succeed. And uh, I guess we were completely overwhelmed by the demand that we had. So, you know, we were expecting, you know, a couple of applications to kind of trickle in. We had something like 200 applications within 24 hours, and then we 
quickly realized that even, you know, accelerating or incubating NFT projects wasn't something that was going to be, um, it was going to be great and we was still going to commit time to it, but there was still a certain limit in terms of the amount of impact that we had. And hence the idea for Hug Hub was really born from that, right? I think we looked at what was one single common problem that creators across the board was facing and what could we build, like what technical solution could we build that was scalable, that would be able to help um, creators on, you know, a more, um, you know, broad level. And I think a lot of that too was, you know, how do we bring in and leverage the power of the community to be able to do that? Because obviously Brandy and I were just two individuals. There's always going, there's only so many hours in a day, so many days in a week, but obviously with the power of a community, we can really elevate and uplift creators. And so we started looking around, honestly, at a lot of, um, you know, solutions that exist in the world today that aren't necessarily Web3. And we realized that because the NFT space has been so noisy, that there really is just a big single problem of discoverability. Right now, when you go into OpenSea, it has, you know, every single NFT project or collection imaginable. And there's no way of filtering anything other than by like what's been trending, like what volumes have been trending over the past 24 hours or a week or a month. Um, and there was a lot of quantitative tools that were available on the market in terms of, once again, what's doing well, like what um, percentage of this project is minted, et cetera. But it wasn't really anything that brought in good old qualitative um, reviews and feedback. So um, Hug Hub was really inspired by, honestly, um, our most uh, popular review and aggregation platform. So you can pick your favorite one, whether that is Yelp or whether it's Rotten Tomatoes for movies or whether it is, um, I don't know, even Google Business. Uh, because at the end of the day, I think we realized that our audience uh, and, you know, we're very passionate, like I said, about elevating creators more so than, you know, just being here to make a quick buck. But we realized that the audience that we were speaking to were really interested in supporting projects that resonated with them. So that could be supporting a particular founding team if I wanted to support like an Asian founded project or a women founded project. Or maybe a lot of our community members are also motivated by specific mission and causes. So, you know, for example, if I was really passionate about sustainability, uh, they would be able to search for sustainability projects. And this solution doesn't exist today. Uh, and so, you know, we were really excited to build it. We started on this journey, I guess, well, like a couple of months ago. Um, and we've been really leveraging the community to start crowdsourcing and community sourcing all of these project details and putting it in our database. You know, it's 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 interesting you say this. I remember even talking to Allison, and she was talking about how you guys were like the you were the main biggest uh, story, I guess, from like how you guys met, how you guys met, right. and how the, how the startup came about. So it's so cool to kind of see how, like, you know, you met in a Discord channel when you were getting into Web three, getting your, getting, uh, you know, just getting understanding what's going on, and then ended up starting a project. And, and this is a cool way to kind of go about it. And now you're helping other people build projects and stuff, and like kind of help, you know, curate and whatnot. Um. Out of curiosity, I, I heard you say on, on a, I think a different show, you're talking about like, like you said, you described it as like rotten tomatoes for NFTs. It's such a cool way to look at it. You're right. The discovery is a huge problem in the space. As of right now, like where are you guys right now, and how do you envision it moving? Yeah. So where we are right now, we have around 300 projects where all of the details have actually been manually sourced and curated by our community. So I think what the blockchain does very well is that it has obviously a lot of publicly available information that's easy to categorize, but finding out who is behind a project, getting the socials of the founders that are behind the project, uh, even finding out who the artist is, a link to the artist portfolio, like all of that requires, uh, you know, a whole bunch of manual work, right? And I think we are very well aware of it because that's essentially what we do when we um, start researching a project. So we started putting together this database, uh, got... I think we started off with about 300 community curators and they started populating this database. Uh, you know, we take um, we take note of every single action and contribution that's being made by each individual. And then we, about a month after that, we minted uh, our NFT uh, membership passes to kind of open it up to a greater group of curators who wanted to be involved and be part of this curation process. And then from these 300 projects, we also had everyone contribute reviews. So we designed a very um, particular kind of review template. So looking at what has worked and what doesn't work uh, in other industries to design a review template. And we have somewhere around like 2,500 reviews across these 300 projects. And right now, all of this exists in the database. The platform is being built. Uh, we're pulling all of the data into the platform on the front end. So everything looks you know, beautiful, easy to use. 
we're expecting to launch a kind of community beta. So for anybody that holds onto an NFT membership pass uh, somewhere around early July. And, you know, once we can see that this is working, uh, we're going to start adding more projects and, you know, also start, uh, we have some information as well about one-of-one artists. So starting to build the platform around um, surfacing one-of-one artists as well. And in terms of where we go from here, I think what actually is really exciting uh, to us, uh, you know, there's obviously a lot more work to go in terms of elevating uh, creators right now. I said we have about 300 projects, I think, and I don't know how many projects there are in the NFT space, but it has to be in like the tens of thousands and not hundreds of thousands at this point. Uh, but I think what we are really excited uh, to do is to bring in this Web3 technology that not only that really re rewards people for their high quality contributions, right? So using tokenomics designs to reward somebody for writing a review. So right now, for example, if you really like this restaurant that you went to, you would fill in this um, review for Google, but you don't really get anything out of it, right? Like maybe somebody could see that you've reviewed like a bunch of restaurants and that's great, but you don't get compensated with anything. Uh, at the same time, we also know that in general, online reviews are losing trust uh, because a lot of companies actually buy fake reviews and, uh, you know, you can, I think they're selling them for, people are selling fake reviews for anywhere from like 25 cents to $100. And all of this is, you know, money and in the economy that could actually go towards honest contributors. And I think the blockchain is what gives us that technology that allows us to be able to design what we believe is a trust-based review system. And we're starting off now with NFTs, but we really see there being a potential to be able to grow this from NFTs to other Web3 products like DAOs. But, you know, what about outside of Web3, right? So what if you could get compensated for writing a review for a movie or a restaurant or a travel experience and using those rewards to actually redeem for some, certain things that, you know, you value? Is that something you guys have already kind of like thought about how are they going to get compensated or are you still kind of working on that? We have had a number of working sessions on tokenomics design. So I would say that nothing is, uh, you know, nothing is finalized just because I think, especially now during the bear market, we've seen how a lot of, you know, even uh, well-designed tokenomics seem to fall short. So, you know, that's, I think that's definitely a lot of work that needs to be done. We will probably test it out with users before introducing a token. So keeping it more like points. So these are just like points that you earn in a game, for example. Um, so I think there's a lot more testing to do. Uh, our focus right now is on really kind of rolling out the platform, making sure that the information is useful. So uh, I think we've really approached building this product from... Um, from the ground up. So starting off with web one, even like when you um, enter a website, how easy to read is the information, how useful is the information, like zero interactions, right? Like, so how can we curate the best possible information for somebody who's on their NFT journey to make the best possible decisions? So that's the web one bit of it. And then obviously the web two side of things is when, okay, somebody can contribute a review. What does the review look like? And when I say that we think about review templates We've looked at how, um, you know, most common review ratings are done on the five-star rating. There's a lot of research out there that shows that a five-star rating is actually very skewed because you either only leave a review when it's really bad or when it's really good. And if you look at a distribution of um, five-star ratings, it ends up being not entirely accurate. So we have thought about how do we re, um, you know, redesign the review template in order to make sure that uh, we can get a balanced review for every single project. And so that's on a web two bit of it. And then finally, once we are we're through all of that, is when we'll enter, we'll introduce the web three element. But like I said, even then still doing a lot of testing more on points. So I would consider that more of like a web 2.5. But uh, but yeah, so we're gradual on this process, but you know, we're really committed to building for the long term. If you want to like access the database of information and some of these reviews now, you can do so with the hug NFT and and this gives you access to the Discord. Yes, that's right. So if you own a Hug NFT, you get access to our uh, holders only Discord. Uh, we have like we, the Discord is available for anyone to read only. But if you would like to participate in the curation process, then you need to hold on to a Hug NFT. We have actually run a very, very small beta to a group of about 10 users about a couple of weeks ago. So that was when um, it was like, you know, the, the alignment wasn't great, but it still had like the basic architecture of the platform. And then what we're working on right now is getting the beta out to users by the first week of July, where, you know, anyone that hosts at Hug NFT, just connect your wallet and then you can log in and then experience what we've put together so far. So at this point, it's more like a Rotten Tomato style reviews and not Yelp style, right? Because Yelp style public can review, whereas Rotten Tomatoes is like curated with like people like who are like, I would say they're like producers or either like the way they right. kind of create that, right? If only they can review is that what it is or right now, or, or how are you thinking yeah. about that? 
I think the intention is that, uh, you know, our, our mission has always been to make information, um, you know, easily accessible. And, you know, like, like I said, it's very um, a huge part of our mission to level the playing field for anyone, right? whether you're a creator or a collector, or whether you're new to the space, whether you're like a seasoned collector. So I think the, the, the intention has always been that uh, once the platform is ready for public consumption, anybody can um, access the web one version of the platform. So anybody can read it. Uh, you can browse, you can, you can uh, go through it. Uh, but if you really wanted to access the rewards earning capabilities of you wanted to contribute your um, your reviews. Uh, obviously, we're looking at social aspects as well. So, you know, just like on Rotten Tomatoes, you may really like a particular movie critic. So you end up following that critic and you see what he has to say about a variety of different pro- um, movies, in our case, projects and artists. Uh, so all of those kind of Web 2 and Web 3 elements would only be accessible to somebody who has a hug NFT. I love it. You, you kind of, if I'm not mistaken, I think it was Chris Dixon who said that, read, write, and own. So it's kind of like you're kind of looking at it like in, in that way, right? Uh, it makes a little sense. Uh, you know, it's interesting because if if the wallet is going to be your identity, I, I think in the future, and this is me speculating, I think it'd be really cool once you can kind of see, you know, who's more influential. You can kind of like take those actions if it's on chain. You know, this this is, this review is like, you know, you can have like algorithm in a sense that this is like more this is more influential because of these people have reviewed specific people have reviewed it or like example it could be like you know 25 out of 300 hug curators have reviewed it for example right and you can kind of have those met, have those different gamification things but you can actually kind of give it a better rating and it could be a better signal based on just like right now if i was to go to google reviews like you said you, there is no like there's no substance behind it i don't know who it is i don't know anything about it or even in yelp sure there is a little bit of like you can see that this person is a top yelp contributor but i remember uh chatting with a uh, person back in the day who was a marketer, marketing person for Yelp, and and their their whole business model was like you know they, that's how they used to go and sign up lo- local businesses and they, they used to pay, and so you know it was in, these people were incentivized they used because that was their job basically, so it was it was a misalignment right. there, and, and I think it's very interesting like the way you're approaching it because especially being on chain, there's a lot of this stuff that you can use, and like you said, you can kind of expand outward, and I think that's very very cool how you guys are going about it. Yeah. And I mean, I think like, um, you know, that's what the good thing about NFTs is. And, you know, obviously a lot of everything stems from the passion to support artists and creators. But uh, like you like you explained, it's so easy for um, I myself as a reviewer um, next to my name. You can show that I hold on to this project or that I've minted this project. So, you know, that I've been, uh, you know, really invested in this project for a long time and, and make of it what you will. Obviously, that could mean that I'm just there to pump my own bags, but at least that information is there and it's transparent. Uh, and I think another uh, another thing that we had done in our review templates was to make sure that it's balanced and that every single review has two open-ended sections. So it will be this project may be for you if, you know, fill in the blank, or this project may not be for you if fill in the blank, right? So it could be obviously a very, uh, you know, uh, impressive blue chip um, project, we'll call it like a board eight. Um, so this project may be for you, if you know, you're um, want to be considered part of this um, uh, exclusive elite community of early adopters, but you know, it may not be for you if you don't have like, I don't know what the price is now, if you don't have $100,000 to drop on an NFT, right? So uh, I think uh, having these reviews, um, designing the template um, appropriately, being able to show whether somebody owns or mi- even minted an NFT allows for a much more transparent, um, you know, review system system where we can really start building and layering on additional levels of trust yeah also like who's following you right or who you're following could be like these people are also recommended this project because people you're following them right it's all unchanged you can see all that data and and like kind of yeah i think that's pretty cool as well right i can see if there's 10 people that i follow or i look up to they're also reviewed this project and they're holders or whatever like that adds more signal and more trust or they've reviewed or right that's also another another part of it so are all these reviews and like this user, I guess we call it user-generated content, is it just immediately posted public or is it kind of routed to your team and you take a look at it first before it goes out? Yeah, so that's part of the whole uh, token uh, tokenization or incentive structure that we're building. So uh, the, the plan is to have a group of community moderators as well. So uh, when somebody writes a review, it will be published, but it will be flagged as like not yet approved or not yet moderated. So obviously working out the copy for that. Um, and then it's kind of held in. Um, so it will be flagged as such until the team of user or community moderators uh, uh, approve it. And then obviously moderators get compensated for moderating a review, right? So uh, the idea is that whether they approve or they reject a review, they will still be compensated equally. Uh, and then obviously as somebody who submits a review, there has to be some skin in the game. So some kind of moderation deposit of some sort. 
um, where you would lose it if your review got rejected, but then if it got approved, you get the deposit back as well as additional um, earnings. So some of the, I guess, uh, I guess incentive structures that we're looking to um, design around this uh, this uh, review system, which, like I said, can be plugged and played into um, another use case. Uh, but yeah, obviously, I think everything always sounds great in theory. So, you know, we are definitely having to go through a whole bunch of testing and iteration to see if this really does incentivize the behavior that we we want, um, we, that we are trying to incentivize, right? Which at the end of the day is high quality contributions, people who are really um, intentional of, you know, supporting projects, sharing their research, sharing their opinions, and not just trying to game the system to earn whatever points or tokens or whatever it may be in the future. Earlier, you were talking about uh, the accelerator program that you had, Group Hug, and that you had, you know, hundreds of applications. How many did you end up accepting, and what was like the some of like the qualifications that they needed, and what did that process just look like for your team? Yeah, so today we are actually mentoring close to thirty uh, different projects. So uh, our team's pretty uh, busy on on both sides of the both sides of the aisle, I guess. Um, but yeah, we're, we're mentoring close to 30 different projects, including a couple of projects that come from Japan and Korea and are by creators who um, English is not their first language. Uh, so, you know, really doing everything that we can to, um, you know, not just talk the talk. We always talk about building an inclusive us, but, you know, how can we walk the walk as well? And so we've been really um, passionate about supporting uh, creators from all walks of life, uh, creators from marginalized communities. Uh, the selection process for uh, our accelerator programs, actually, interestingly enough, follows a very similar framework to how we built our review template. I don't even know which one came first, but when we started looking at a whole bunch of different projects, we realized that there were probably four main buckets that everybody should um, look at projects, or at least that's the way that we have chosen to look at projects. So one of it being um, the team, I think is incredibly important. Uh, you know, Any NFT project is very much like an early stage um, startup. So, you know, you can always pivot, uh, you know, you, there are always things that are going to be thrown your way and you can pivot in, in whatever direction. But the one thing that is really hard to change is the team. So that's one um, that's one bucket that we look at. Another bucket that we look at is around the business or the roadmap. I think we can all agree the NFT space has undergone, um, you know, a lot of change and evolution over the past um, several, uh, I guess, past several months, especially as more and more NFT projects have started um, coming to um, you know, coming to market. So, you know, really looking at how does one business, um, how does one product's business or roadmap really differ and what sets them apart. Uh, and then the other thing that we look at is also community. So, um, you know, who is this, what kind of community is this project targeting? So we always ask projects in the interview process, like exactly who do you expect your target customer to be? Which I think, um, you know, a lot of these good practices that we had from Web2, call it Web2 or even like real life businesses where if I wanted to start, like, call it, I wanted to start a bar, like, I have to decide, is this going to be a fancy bar, like, with that sells cocktails, or is this going to be a dive bar, you know, like, but depending on how I designed a bar, my vision for the bar was going to attract a very different um, customer set. And I think a lot of projects haven't really gone through the exercise of, like, who exactly is my customer, and how am I going to acquire them? So we look at community, the strength of it, if they've already set one, uh, or, you know, their plans while building that community around that mission and vision that they have. And then, for generative projects, we also look at like art, which I get is totally subjective. But uh, I think one thing that we do look for is how original, how innovative uh, is this um, type of art that we've seen and the artists that they're working with. Because, um, you know, derivatives um, derivatives can do really well, like, you know, a, a right after the mint. But, you know, typically after that, there's very little to kind of keep the community like together based on that. Right. Obviously, there are always exceptions. But in general, we've looked for artwork that is original, has like a different point of view. So, these are the four buckets that we evaluate every single project that comes through um, that applies for our accelerator. And then actually in the review template, we introduce something similar to compliments, like for your Uber driver. So, you know, after you write an Uber, you can say that was like that person had great music, right? So we have four categories of compliments uh, across the, these same buckets that we look at our projects. And then somebody that writes a review after filling in the positive or the not so positive um, review about this project, they can select to give compliments across these four different categories as well. Review seems to be a common theme here. Uh, <laughs> what are some of the biggest challenges you guys have seen with the creators that you have had so far in your accelerator? I mean, I think some of the biggest challenges is that uh, the market has got quite saturated. So, you know, I, I formally entered the space in January and, and I would say that then you could probably mint anything 
And you would probably have been able to, you know, double or triple your money because there was just a lot of people, you know, excited to get into NFTs, looking to, um, you know, this was a new asset class for them. And and then even like women led projects or like women profile picture projects, like had this huge surge in the beginning of the year. I think obviously, you know, it's it's market dynamics, right? The more uh, projects like this be successful, the more it attracts other people to do the same. And then you end up having a whole bunch of very undifferentiated um, you know, projects, right. That look very similar to each other. If you look at the roadmaps, they all somewhat read the same It's like, you know, 10% goes to charity, like, um, or whatever. And then, and, and, you know, it just feels very similar and it really isn't a very distinctive point of view. So I think a number of projects that we have worked with, like, I would say that, you know, at the point of time when we took them in it would have seemed like they were thriving. They had, you know, very healthy volumes. They had a very healthy floor price. And then obviously now, um, I would say it's, it's twofold. Like one is, there is greater supply in the market. So, you know, um, and there's greater supply, like that value is diluted. And obviously we're also going through a bear market right now where in general people are just more cautious about how much capital they're deploying to risky assets and NFTs are a risky asset. So um, I think that for a lot of projects, it has been, you know, really about narrowing in on what the value proposition is, what is a brand stand for, what is a community stand for, um, simple things like even speaking directly to community members. And it's something that, you know, I try and do, like I, ha I have a daily like um, virtual coffee session with people from the community just to be able to keep, you know, finger on the pulse on exactly how people are feeling, right? Like what could we create that gives them more value? And so these are some of the things that we have been working very closely with projects and how they continue to pivot their business model, look for additional revenues outside of secondary royalties. Um, I think on an aggregate level, open sea volumes at this point have also dried up significantly compared to, you know, a couple of months ago. So to rely completely on secondary royalties as a form of like passive income, is just, you know, not really going to work anymore. You know, once they're in this accelerator program, like what types of things are you got, or is your team mentoring them on? I guess a little beyond uh, what you had mentioned. Yeah, so each project goes through a four to six week curriculum that is, um, and that, and they are being taken through that by our um, director of creative programming. His name is Michael. Uh, he as a creative producer, uh, and you know, has also produced a lot of produced a number of shows on Broadway. So you know, understands how that creative um, business side of things work. Uh, so this. This uh, four to six week curriculum covers everything from, you know, um, starting from the beginning. What, what are your values? What problem are you trying to solve? Uh, you know, wh how, what is the strength of your community? What are some of the ways that you can start growing your presence on Twitter? How to better, um, you know, engage with your community? And then even putting together like what that business plan looks like. You know, I think it's very, it's very, uh, it's really back down to the basics of what problem are you trying to solve? Like, why are you the team to be solving that problem? Uh, and, you know, how are you going to solve it? And, you know, what data can you collect along the way that will allow you to de-risk any other assumptions that you're making? So, you know, really bringing them through kind of like a startup bootcamp, if you will. Um, and, and and on top of that, each of them also have one-on-one -on -one, one -on -one office hours with myself, with Randy uh, for projects. We work with projects, too, that like haven't minted out yet. So um, we actually had one of our projects mint yesterday. And we, uh, you know, we even gave them last minute um, dev support. So uh, I think they had like a bit of a like last minute glitch of their contract. So, you know, before the mint, like, you know, we're on Zoom with them for like three hours, like make, auditing their smart contract, making sure that everything was good to go. Uh, and then also doing things like, you know, uh, all the publicity and the PR exposure stuff. You know, Randy has her own podcast as well. Um, she invites a bunch of them to speak on that. Uh, and then, yeah, being part of, um, you know, writing Twitter threads, you know, in a way that can best showcase what they're building. Uh, so, yeah, I think we basically support them a lot through um, sometimes it's just emotional support. I think a lot of times like entrepreneurs need that. Uh, but also giving them sort of the business skills and then where, where required um, developmental support as well as one on one advice. I actually listened to Randy's pod, like one of the podcasts Randy was on and one of the podcasts you were on. And I loved how you guys summarized it. Um, I think Randy said it in a way. She's like, we're the second stop on somebody's NFT journey where they've already finished their mint and they're like, oh shit, what's next kind of thing. And I remember you saying something like Web3 has given creators the infrastructure, but yeah, we're helping them, the skills they're lacking to succeed, basically. I think it was a very good way to put it. Uh, you're right, because a lot of people like who have minted now they're like, what's next? Like, what do we do now? Uh, and so I, I can see like, so are you guys like, how, how are you, how do you guys approach that? Like, how do you kind of advise like, you know, well, what's, how should you like kind of 
the fundamentals or how should you think about it? Like It's funny because uh, I, I've described this before, like uh, for anybody who has started a business before, typically your journey looks like this, right? You are pulling together whatever funds that you can have, right? Whether it's like, I don't know, $5,000, $10,000, maybe a little bit more. Um, and then you are hustling really hard to um, to make something happen, to create something out of nothing. And then you hope that you will get your first customers and then your customers start paying you revenue, which then, you know, which you can then reinvest into the business. I think a lot of NFT projects, um, you know, just because of the virtual Web3, they um, it's almost the opposite where they make a lot of revenue from day one. If they have a successful mint, especially like you could suddenly be um, have like a few hundred thousand dollars like from day one. And then all of a sudden, okay, sure, you pay your artists, you pay the people that work for you. But I think after that, um, like most startups don't have that luxury. Like and th that startup that I had to wind down, um, I was in over 70 different venture capital fund meetings trying to raise um, $250,000, right? And, and I was trying to raise like $500,000. And at the end of 70 different VCs, I only had to say yes. And I could only raise about $150,000, right? So the amount of effort and the time that went into it, um, and then even then I still hadn't made any revenue, right? So for a lot of NFT projects, it's almost it's, it's the complete opposite where they have this kind of like a windfall. They have all of this revenue from day one. And I think in the beginning, there was a sudden expectation, especially because trading volumes right after a mint tend to be pretty high. So you're like, great, if I made like $10,000 in secondary royalties in like the first seven days, is that, does that mean I'm going to keep making that amount of money? And obviously we realized that's not the case. Uh, and I think a lot of projects also then realize that they may not necessarily have had the same financial discipline as you, as one would have had um, starting their own business. I suddenly remember the day when I started my first business. It's just after I paid the rent. Like it was literally like paid the rent, paid the people that work for me. There was literally nothing left, right? You really had to figure out how you could um, make every little cent count, right? Like if it meant having to clean the toilets myself, like I would have to do that just to save on whatever cash that I had. Uh, but I think for a lot of NFT, and this is obviously a generalization, some projects are incredibly well run, but I think a lot of projects um, being first time entrepreneurs or being artists and entrepreneurs don't necessarily approach this situation through that lens. And so um, I think where we've had to come in has been to really look at, all right, what are your plans, right? Are you really hiring the right team to actually uh, achieve the set of milestones that you're uh, setting out to do? Uh, and then also, and I think for a lot of them, really going back to the drawing board of, you know, why why did you even create this project in the first place, right? And I think, thankfully, a lot of the creators that we work with, like, they're all, you know, mission-driven. Like, no one was re really here for a quick cash grab. Um, I think if they were, they would all have probably have left. They're like, you know, I got my cash ready. Like, I don't, I don't answer. Um, I'm not answerable to the community. And they aren't, right? Because NFTs are not a financial security is not a stock coding in a company. Uh, it was they sold a bunch of JPEGs. Um, and frankly, they can do whatever it is they want to do with that money, right? Like, so I mean, so the good thing is that most, most of not all of the creators that we work with, like they're all here because they have a bigger vision, they have a bigger plan, and they've been really adaptable into thinking through, you know, how, how should they, or even do they need to pivot their business model? And how can they start thinking about, you know, like I said, additional business of revenue opportunities that goes beyond their secondary proceeds and the mint. Very cool. You talked about something. Uh, I'm kind of taking it back to when we're chatting about building the reviews, uh, the review system and stuff like that. Uh, you talked about something right now with the accelerator where the art is subjective, right? How does that work with when you are like when the curators are coming up with reviews of the projects because it is subjective as well, right? Like the art part of it, and sure they can look at the founders, but how is there like a template you guys have in place, or how do you approach that? On, on what's on what's a good project and what's not a good project or how to review a project again. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, we definitely provide guidelines in terms of what kind of reviews that we're looking for. So I think it just more in terms of thoughtfulness, um, like um, and and length. I mean, I don't want to say that a longer review is always better. Some people can be very concise and still give a very um, good review. But I think it's to acknowledge that uh, NFT projects are subjective. They are art based community projects. Some of them come with utility, but um, I mean, a utility for, I don't know, I'm, I'm making the, things up, like say a project that gives me free beer, like maybe I don't drink beer. So maybe that has like no utility to me. So I'm like not interested in it, but it could mean it could be something extremely valuable to another group of people. So, um, but I think that's the case with restaurants, that's the case with movies. Um, you know, I think it's um, funny that I think in the NFT space, we have so many quantitative tools, like we have so many things that track volume, like unique holders, like percentage that are listed, um, floor price, obviously. We have so many of these tools that track 
quantitative measures um, that, you know, I think is very supportive of people who are trading in and out of NFTs. Uh, but we don't have um, really much tools at all that support um, the sharing of research. And, you know, we always say in an NFT space, you know, DYOR, do your own research. What we've been seeing a lot of is that, you know, people will go into this alpha channel and whatever Discord server that they're in or alpha group, and then they'll share all of this. Hey, you know, I just discovered this project. Like the founders are awesome, blah, blah, blah. The project mints and then the project starts crashing and there's no way to really find this information, right? Like right now I have to go into my Discord, try and search the history, try and remember who it was that said such a thing, um, you know, and then figure out if I want to reach out to that person to find out more or, you know, go on my own kind of path to do my own research as opposed to being at a place where all of that research has been archived. We can see what somebody had said. Obviously, we will allow people to update their reviews as new information comes in, but at least it's all there and there's like a central location where everybody can locate and share those reviews. Uh, and then, like I said, obviously it is subjective, but I think that's why we have designed a review template in a way that forces someone to think of something good as well as think of something, you know, I mean, I don't even want to say bad, but think of something that makes a project not ideal for someone. And, you know, I can think of like some of my favorite projects, every single one of the projects that I'm in, actually, I can think of something that, oh, well, that may not be for someone, right? Like um, you could be really passionate about the art and supporting the artists, but like this may not be for you if you're in it for like a quick flip, right? And I think there are a lot of projects that actually like fall under that bucket. Um, so, you know, I think it's uh, why we're excited is to really show that people do have high, like everyone has a, has an opinion that is worth elevating and putting in front of other people. And it shouldn't be limited to, you know, just these select groups that people are in. And so that's what we're really trying to encourage people to do. I don't think we've talked about it like um, extensively. I think we've always thought about how would we expand beyond NFTs because obviously, um, you know, there are. Within Web3, we all pick our lane, right? Like I somehow I found myself in an NFT lane, um, mostly because I love working with creators and I love speaking to artists every single day. Uh, and and also before I went into startups, I was a consumer, I was a consumer investor. So I was an investor and financial analyst in um, anything consumer. So NFTs was just a very natural fit for me because I looked at NFTs as consumer goods that live on a blockchain. But obviously, um, like I was saying, everybody that comes into Web3 ends up picking their own lane, whether it is NFTs, whether it's getting involved in a DAO, uh, whether it is going to DeFi, whether it is um, trying additional like Web3 tools, right? There's a whole gamut or like choosing whatever cryptocurrencies, protocols. So even within the Web3 space, if we were to apply this framework to, you know, other products to really be able to curate that amount of information in the right community who would want to review like a DAO, those are going to be a very different group of people from the people who are going to be reviewing um, NFTs, obviously. And so um, I think that's where what you describe gets interesting, right? Like, are we an infrastructure play where, you know, everything has already been designed, the templates have already been designed, but instead of an NFT project, it just features, um, you know, different, it would just, it would have different feels, but it would just feature, you know, something different, a DAO um, or whatever it is that even when we go out of Web3. So I think those are some of the things that we're um, thinking about. I think within the NFT review platform itself, we've definitely thought of like pulling in any other open APIs to bring in some of that quantitative element. Like we don't, we still don't want to detract from, you know, the review side of it, but obviously there are some quantitative measures that are interesting. So even some of the things that we have pulled out right now, um, we can show uh, what percentage of hug um, NFT holders hold a particular project. So for example, um, like, I don't know, I think something like, 20% of Hug NFT holders own a Meta Angels as well. Uh, so this is all like information that we can pull out, which is kind of like a nice, like you said, like fun, I don't, wouldn't even say it's like gamifying it, but I guess it adds like a social element to, you know, the projects and not just kind of coming in and writing reviews and like earning tokens off for doing that. Yeah, I think one other thing that I really found, you know, very well thought out was how you kind of, how you separated it from uh, projects that have already minted versus um projects that haven't minted yet with with a uh, hedgehog yeah and i mean i think it's just knowing that every um these projects are just in a very different life cycle a um, different part of their life cycle uh and you know i think we also realized that the support that is needed from um, projects that haven't minted out yet are or haven't minted yet is just very different um like you wouldn't have like these calls like you know last minute sos calls on like your smart contract right because that would have already been done um that, that wouldn't have been um there wouldn't be discussions uh, or conversations around mint strategy so like how many wallets should i be collecting like what kind of assumptions should i have around um you know people like how many nft somebody is minting so 
um, it has definitely helped to kind of keep um, those programs separate. Um, you know, where uh, and group hug is a lot more about, like I said, financial discipline. Before you mint, you have all the financial discipline in the world, right? Like I think a lot of project founders would only agree to pay um, or would tend to negotiate payment terms where I'm offering you, the artist, like a percentage of mint or you, the, my developer, a percentage of mint, right? So being very cash conscious before you mint. And then projects that are minted out, like I explained before, um, you know, all of a sudden you have all this money. So I think it's about like resource allocation, resource management, tri- um, risk management as well. Uh, and so it's been really helpful to kind of keep both groups um, separate. Yeah, I feel like it's like when you think about like Accelerator or Incubator, you think of it as like brand new off the ground, like seed investment. They haven't even minted out yet. And the, but now I, it's it's great that you also have Group Hug where it's like it's not too late to get this kind of help and mentorship to help keep your project going, get it to the next level. Yeah, absolutely. And I think a lot of, um, you know, like a lot of project founders, like I said, especially during this bear market environment that we're in, are really craving that mentorship and craving that support. I heard like Randy say, and I could I could feel the emotions. And so I want to know if that's a rant that happens behind the scenes or how you guys are thinking about that is I heard to say, we need Web3 Discord and if anybody's there, come to me or whatever. What are the challenges you are facing right now with Discord? Oh gosh, where do I begin? I mean, um, first of all, there are we're in so many different Discord servers. This is I mean, so this is a gripe that I've had um, from the beginning, in that typically when you support, especially among like um, women who want to support women founded projects, right? So there are uh, like a few like really um, like well known ones. Like you have your World of Women, you have your Boss Beauties, like maybe Women and Weapons or what have you, and so. I would say that I wouldn't be surprised if most people who owned a Boss Beauty also owned like a project um, in, you know, in this category of projects. But every single one of these projects have their own Discord. And so then what happens is that I end up going to like, do I have, do I seriously have to go to four different Discord servers to speak to the same person? You know, like, so that to me has been like just this biggest disconnect. Like I'm in, um, I'm in another um, community um, pop by CPG. And so they, they, I guess they house theirs in Telegram, um, which, you know, it's also not an ideal solution in my opinion, but, um, but I will go into the Telegram group and pretty much almost everyone in the Telegram group I have interfaced with, um, whether it is through my own Discord server, another community's Discord server, or my or on Twitter. So it just feels like there's a lot of different platforms to keep up with. So I, I would say that's one. Then obviously Discord um, security has been a huge um, challenge for a lot of projects. I think thankfully we haven't had our first major attack yet. Like you know, um, but who knows? A knock on wood. Uh, you know, a lot we've seen very high profile projects get their Discords compromised, right? And a lot of community members end up losing very valuable NFTs. And obviously it feels awful, like uh, as a NFT project founder, like for your it's almost like your family got robbed, and there's like nothing that you could do about it. Uh, so I would say that that's an, like another huge challenge. Um, and then I think a lot of it too is just there is so much volume of you know communication, but at the same time, it's a bit of a I don't know. I feel like we're a ca- caught between a rock and a hot place, and that the Web three community does expect a lot of communication. Like um, you know, I've heard so many times from NFT product founders like the day after they mint it, then you know the entire community is asking, okay, now what? And it's like, they just, the, that team just raised the money. And now people are expecting updates after updates, like day after day, right? So I think on one hand, the community demands um, regular updates. They demand like high touch communication. But on the other hand, too much communication is also overwhelming. So I think, um, and then Discord, because of the way it's organized, I think it allows for a lot of communications to just take place on like a day in, day out um, uh, basis. And then that's, that's just if you're trying to keep up with one project. So let alone if you're trying to keep up with like, 10 different projects. And so, I mean, even for me personally now, like I probably only really keep up with call it three to five, even though I ha- I do own a number of different NFTs, but it's just physically like impossible to keep track on what every single project is doing. And, and I know you, I mean, you kind of described because you described the problem here, but I'm just wondering if you guys, have you guys like kind of like riffed on what does that perfect solution look like in a, in a, in a, in a hypothetical world? Um, I mean, I know a lot of people that have been building, um, you know, kind of, Pro, like uh, solutions to kind of tackle uh, Discord. I mean, I think that community is obviously important, but I do think that there are, I, I actually look at community in like three different ways. So you have your own community, that's one. I also see the future of community of communities. So I think a platform that can really support 
um, like even for us, right? Like we have, we're mentoring 30 different projects. There should be an easy way for the projects within our accelerator to talk to each other. Right now, like because everybody's running their own Discord service and we can help to facilitate conversations, it's still like, it's still a lot of heavy lifting, right? So I feel like um, a solution in the future that allows people to communicate with each other even across communities, especially if communities have a lot of shared community members, that's something that I'll be looking for. And then the other aspect of community that we've been um, that we've kind of solved so far with Discord is micro community. So, and I don't know if you're familiar with like Dunbar's law, but you know Dunbar's law is the the law that you know any like anyone can only have like 150 close personal relationships at any time. I think on Web three, I don't know exactly what that number is, but I think um, when it comes to communities, I, I think Professor Dunbar has mentioned that it's probably around like three communities. Um, so even then, an individual can only is only physically able to you know maintain relationships with three different communities. But then within the community, if that community has like thousands of members, it's almost like impossible to really nurture those relationships. And so that's why I'm very bullish on micro communities and forming like interest specific interest groups where people are given a structure and a framework to get to know each other and really form close relationships with each other. So. We have done that in our hug community, actually. So our hug NFT passes, if you look at them, there are 10 different types of hugs. If you have a matching pair, it unlocks access to a particular committee. So we have a huge range of committees, like this one called um, on a tree hug. It's called the Touching Grass Group. So it's basically people who plan like real life events. Uh, and then we have um, one with the space hugs. If you have a matching pair, you're basically put on this committee where you can use our platform to host your own Twitter spaces. We help you to um, grow your own personal brand. You kind of become our unofficial like press corps. Um, so, uh, so we have already started organizing our, com our community within these micro communities. And uh, it's been early. I think it's only been like a few weeks, but it's been really interesting to see what happens when you really empower individual groups of people and just say that, hey, this is your mission. Um, this obviously resonated with you since you acquired that matching pair to be a part of this committee. Now, these are the resources that we can give to you. Like, how far do you want to um, take it? How far do you want to run away with it? I, I love that answer, by the way. And I want to kind of take one step further because I just love the way you think. Well, how do you define a community and why do people join a community? I think a community at, at, the, at the simplest definition is a group of people with a shared interests or shared goals or shared vision, shared, shared something, right? Ideally, all of, all of the above, right? Like a shared goal, shared vision, shared values. I think what keeps a community strong is that there needs to be very clear ways on how a community can engage and contribute, how a community member can engage and contribute to the greater purpose, that greater shared purpose and shared values. So I think what a lot of communities um, find is like a great, uh, we have a community that's about like an, uh, onboarding women onto Web3, right? I'm just like picking a random um, like uh, mission. But community members, when they join that, they uh, you know, don't necessarily know how they can contribute to this cause, right? So I think it needs to be very clear when onboarding somebody to the community, this is, these are the different ways they can get involved. And that's not just you know, joining a general chat and saying like, GM, how are you? And then like popping off, right? Because there's no, I can do that anywhere. Like this, that doesn't make this community special. But I think once they, it's clear about how they can contribute and engage, then there needs to be ways of rewarding. Um, and some of these can be just surprises, right? Like you don't have to, it doesn't have to be transactional that if you offer this, um, if you if you contribute it in this way, you're going to get X. Um, it doesn't necessarily have to be that way. I think in fact, sometimes surprises or reward, surprise rewards actually work better because people feel that they're being noticed and feel that they're being seen. So a lot of this is like a cycle of like, a, what exactly is that shared vision and shared goal? And then secondly, how does somebody engage? And then lastly, how is that person rewarded? Because that reward, um, whether it is emotional and like I said, rewards doesn't have to be financial in nature. It could very much just be, um, you know, a sense of belonging or like a, an emotional attachment to um, that's being formed with the other community members. But being able to build that into sort of your community design, like I think is what really um, keeps the community um, like tight knit. And then the challenge after that is obviously how you grow the community because any new person that you add in obviously doesn't feel that same tie. So I think that bit is still something that I'm frankly still trying to navigate as we move from like a really small, tight knit community to like adding more and more members because like a 300, a, a community, the size of 300 is very different from that, a size of 3,000, 30,000. Uh, but yeah, something that we constantly think about and constantly iterate on.
you know, I, I, the reason I ask this question is because I always think about this too. I'm like, man, it's so crazy to think about like people are like chatting on Discord and then something like NFT NYC happens or like, you know, uh, VCon happens and the people who are just like, just like pseudonyms in a sense, right? There is like these usernames and then they meet and then they're like, but they have this shared like history, right? Of like being in a Discord channel for like three months or four months and going back and forth. And now they're meeting in real life. Like, how does that look? Like, you know, from, from yeah. that this is an interesting concept and i'm like always ask why you know what i mean uh like you said it's, it's overwhelming there's a lot going on so how do you kind of navigate that and how many people the dunbar's number how many people you're actually going to meet in real life right and who and it's just a, it's an interesting concept and it just amazes me yeah i'm gonna quote uh, i'm gonna share something that andrew wang and so i'm not taking credit for for this at all uh but you know, I think Andrew um, spoke a lot about how um, tight knit communities move from low context communication to high context um, communication. So meaning that, um, so I think his example is that if you take the word GM, uh, you know, to the outside wall, it stands for General Motors, right? Like no one knows what GM stands for. Um, if you are like, if you are, I guess, in the Web3 space, you know that GM stands for good morning. If you're really, really part of a tight-knit community, GM is not just good morning. It's about like this idea of like uplifting and being there for each other and knowing that we're all in this together, right? So that was kind of his, um, you know, I guess, example of like low context and like high context communication. So I think for every community that when it's first formed, they, um, you know, have to rely on very low context communication because somebody is new, right? Like I'm brand new. I just joined this Discord server. Like I'm trying to figure out exactly what this is about, right? So like, what is hug? Hug is, you know, fill in the blanks and this is what we do. Um, when is your mint date? Like all of these are very low context type communications, right? Like it's very easily understood by anybody that's coming in. I think over time, a community does tend to form its own culture, right? Its own like private jokes, its own like um, private references. So that's when communication starts to get more and more high context. So I think the challenge for everyone is that um, obviously you can't force any of these. You can't be like, hey guys, this is the secret language that, you know, we're all only going to use, um, you know, amongst each other. But I think it's something that just ends up being nurtured over time, depending on, you know, the kinds of activities that you're holding in your Discord, the kinds of um, discussions that you're having. Um, and it really pushing people to start like embracing and discovering some of these like private like jokes or you know styles of communication with each other, and that really starts to strengthen a community over time. Yeah, and like you said, right? It's like it's like the retention part of it is so interesting too, right? Like what keeps them there, right? Like after a while, once you're kind of part of it, it's like like yeah, like how what there's so much there's so much we get hit on by so much stuff in 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 this in, in this web life, right? Where attention is the only asset that we have and it's an interesting thing about that like what keeps you at a certain place compared to because you can only be a part of like you said three to five communities or whatever it is like that is so intriguing to me and how this is going to evolve and what's going to happen with this are there other things like like these broad level topics that interest you a lot in the in the web3 world so obviously community building is something that i i think of a lot uh and it's it's funny because i don't think i've ever considered myself a community builder. That's not really how I would describe myself, but obviously having now building a company in Web3, I'm now really living it every day, right? Like I see how strangers who didn't know each other came together to submit 300 project details with, you know, 3000 reviews, right? And like what person would do that, right? Like this is, and this is despite us, you know, being, and we've said that, you know, we'll reward contributions with like tokens in the future, like airdrops, whatever, but like none of this is set in stone. So, you know, a lot of people are really getting involved with like no guaranteed promise of being rewarded for their time. But at the same time, knowing that this is voluntary, like no one has any kind of minimum time expectations whatsoever. So now that, you know, so now that I'm actively in this space, yes, I think a lot about community building. I think a lot also about how, Unfortunately, the NFT space is still, the, the volumes are still very much driven by whales. Um, so, you know, and they obviously tend to fit a certain demographic. So, you know, I think a lot of the times, like, they influence whether uh, there is high training volume behind an NFT project. And a lot of that comes from speculation and hype and doesn't really come from, um, you know, whether you're investing in a business. And I think for somebody who spends seven years in, as an investor and then another four years in startups, for me, that's like a very strange Thing to wrap my head around because I make investments like I, I I guess the type of investor that I was I was always a very long term investor right so I'm looking at how is a, a company positioned to uh, succeed are there like macro trends I'm looking at things from a very rational um like way um and I'm not really the kind of person that's like chasing volume and numbers you know I respect that that's like a different skill uh, but I think what ends up happening is that there are a lot of 
legitimate projects or legitimate companies being built, but unfortunately they don't get that same recognition um, as they do because they somehow didn't make it on the radar of like this random alpha group, right? Um, and, you know, are there people, are there influencers being paid? I know that there are, like, so there's like paid influencer marketing that's happening. And, you know, like, so I think it's this bit of a disconnect for me where I feel people would like to judge an NFT project based on its floor price, based on a lot of these quantitative metrics, because those are the metrics are what, um, are what people can see. But there's so many things that people don't see. And unfortunately, we're not in an environment yet where that information is being shared or being like, you know, promoted to everybody else. It's so interesting you say this, but because I, you know, I, I come from startup world as well. Like so I went through Y Combinator. And so found, foundationally, I've always been used to like, you know, looking at the business and looking at all that. And then I got dropped into the NFT world and it was like just a whole different world. Right. And and, and and then the more you learn about it, it's interesting to think how the world is changing, because like in the future, I was listening, I was reading a Masari report and he was kind of talking about it, how in the future we'll probably be investing in in like, you know, kids out of like out of like college and be like, hey, I want to be a part of their, you know, their I will make money on their income to drop. And if they drop school and go join this this uh, uh, start, start a startup will be funding that. And if it makes money, like you're basically investing in somebody's education in a sense, and you're taking a part of their percentage share, right. Of their, of their income they make, or, or something along the lines of like, you know, like assuming like, like how Scooter Braun found Justin Bieber, like today, you know, there was no chance like in back uh, now we can actually like, invest in some artist who's coming out and like, you know, it's Justin Bieber of the next generation, I guess, whatever. Right. And yeah. we invest early and we can have all the upside. It's just so interesting to think about that, it's the, it, but it's not foundational anymore. It's not like what, who's the founders and who, you know, what are they building? And it's just like, it's just on basically on like your gut in a sense, or like, just, yeah, you're kind of going with what you feel rather than actually the logical decision. And it's just an interesting ch- shift. Um, yeah. I, I'm always like intrigued by it, how, it, how it's all kind of going. Yeah. I mean, I'll be interested to know like what most people's like investment time horizon is on like buying an NFT. Cause I think, you know, when I first entered, you know, I was very, you know, wide eyed, bushy tailed of like, oh great. You know, I'm like investing in this in the long run. You, you obviously look at like projects I bought eight at how much they have appreciated in value over a year. Right. So you're thinking, man, if I hold out long term, like, uh, you know, that's when I'm really going to get the big gains, but you know, 99.99% of projects, I would say that a lot of people take profits, you know, I wouldn't be surprised like 24 hours, like within 24 hours of the mint, right? I don't know, like, and I mean, like I said, there's nothing wrong with that investment um, style. It's just that as project founders where, um, and as a startup founder where, you know, you're so, your emotions are so intrinsically tied with what other people's perceived value is of that project. Like it can be very hard to navigate. Um, And like I was explaining before, like, you know, most project founders don't really have that, um, you know, don't have that tenacity or haven't really looked at it through that lens before. Yeah, and I, you know, I also think about this quite a bit, like, because as a startup founder, I actually don't like taking funding. It's just a, it's a, it's a fine balance because like when you have 10,000 people and you're building something and you sh- sell them the dream and you take funding from them and, you know, like they're not, they're going to be on your ass and you don't want to deal with that. It's a, it's a stress that, you know, it's it's not easy building a startup. And I think that's why the Anon versus non non is a very different, interesting uh, balance there. Like anonymously, yeah, you can do it and you, you run away or whatever. It didn't work out. Not even a bad way. You tried and it didn't work out. It's fine. But if you are like, you know, uh, if you have your identity on the line, like people like will can hunt you down. It's not, it's not good to be, in, you know, and so it's, it's, a, it's interesting when people don't think about when they're building a startup and, and how, how much baggage it can have on your life and i don't know i think about that a lot when, when, we, when we're thinking about like launching an nft because it is fundraising is what it is it is legit fundraising and you are selling dreams to people who are actually not even your users they're basically investors and uh, well, not investors they are investing in the art but they are they're not your users they're not going to be using your product for the most part in this in this ecosystem right and and, and so it's, it's such an interesting thing how you like yeah how pe- people don't think about that it's more like oh i'm gonna make a couple of million dollars but what is right. what comes after there's a whole different game. I just want to know, like, what uh, are some of the NFT collections that actually I don't want you to answer any of the projects that you are involved in or even oh. any of the ones that I know, like Meta Angels and Curious Addies. I know you love you guys love that. But outside, of, I want to know what are some of the projects that you are kind of interested in, like what they're building, even though you're a holder or not a holder, just kind of something that you're kind of curious on what that's going to look like in five years from now. I mean, I'm very interested. I'm like very intrigued by like um, meme projects, and I guess Goblins is like a one that you know is, is on the top of everyone's mind. And you know, obviously they you know now they dox themselves as being um, part of or being founded by a larger team at Truth that has also been behind a bunch of other projects. Um, but I, you know, I and I I don't have the inside scoop, so I don't know if they knew that it was going to be such a hit success. 
Uh, but, you know, obviously that came about from, you know, community like where we talk about high context um, communication. All of a sudden, if you wrote in funny superscript and subscript um, text, you were considered a goblin, right? Like to somebody else looking in on that and be like, this person's crazy. Like, why can't they just write normally? Uh, but, you know, and obviously it became um, it was a free mint that ended up just, you know, doing incredibly well. Um, and I would say that I do believe that memes drive culture. I think, unfortunately, I think I have enough self awareness to know that I'm not like, like I'm not like one of those like very memey people. Like I, I just don't think of memes. Like I get it. I think it's hilarious, but I just don't like kind of think in terms of like for the culture, right? Like, and maybe it's like a lot of my background. Like I said, of being an investor, being a startup founder, I just think of it very much in like this is what makes a good business. But you know what makes a good business does not necessarily make a good NFT project or collection as what we had discussed. So um, I, I think I'm very intrigued by projects that can um, that are formed just based on vibes only. And and like that's the thing. Like I think as a founder, it can get very frustrating. You're like, oh my gosh, I, I'm toiling away. Like I'm spending hours on my own community's Discord and this and you know trying to do up a business plan. And this other project literally has no business, no roadmap, no docs founder, and that project's like doing like incredibly well right and i think it's easy to be in that mindset of like how can they be doing so well like this is so unfair like you know the world is messed up like you know this is a place i don't want to play in anymore um but i think there's always something to be learned from that right like you know at, at the end of the day it is a form of art it is a form of culture um and so i think those are the things that i've been trying to you know learn more about or I am intrigued about. And I, I feel like the fact that I'm even saying that I'm intrigued about it or that I, I want to learn about it already shows that I just don't get it, which is it's fine, right? Like, you know, it's either something that you get or you don't. Uh, but yeah, it's something that I'm interested to see um, how that continues, how they, you know, continue building, how meme projects can turn a meme into a bigger brand, which is suddenly, I think, what Goblins is doing and, and has done an incredible job at it um, in just like a few weeks. So, um, so yeah, excited to kind of keep uh, tabs on more of those projects going forward. Love that. Let's end on that happy note on don't fall into the victim mentality and keep doing you, keep building good stuff and keep improving. Thanks so much for coming on the show, Debbie. Appreciate it. Yes, thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks so much for having me.